In 1999, Tom Brokaw, journalist and TV anchor, published a book entitled The Greatest Generation. This was a book that became insanely popular. In fact, I kept seeing it in people's homes, and so finally, just a couple of years ago, I read it. It's a book that describes the generation born between 1901 and 1927, the generation that has been called the greatest generation. Of course, you might ask, well, what made this generation, the people from 1901 to 1927, so great? Well, two things. Well, there were many reasons, but the big two are that the recession of 1929, the Great Depression, Black Tuesday on October 29th, when that happened and the stock market collapsed, the people of this generation were anywhere between 2 and 18 years old. And so this greatest generation survived the Great Depression. But more than that, after they survived this Great Depression, on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the U.S. entered into the war. This greatest generation during that time were anywhere between 14 and 30 years old. So this generation of men and women took the brunt of the Great Depression and World War II, and they came out ahead, and they became known as the greatest generation. They accomplished many things, but one little fact, however, something that is largely unknown, is that this greatest generation is just about solely responsible for the thousands of church buildings that we have across the state of California. And in fact, this very building, the very ground upon which I stand, the structure under which I teach, was built by the greatest generation in the 1960s. So how and why did this happen? Why it happened was because after the Great Depression, uh, millions of people immigrated to California, came to California uh, for jobs and for work, and after World War II, uh, the, the mass exodus, or rather the mass exodus from the Midwest continued, and California became this thriving economy. During the Great Depression, though, people were so poor, the... Um, Unemployment rate was anywhere between 22 to 33 percent, depending upon the county. People were desperate. There was even a story that came out of a woman who actually put her children up for sale. She sold her children for one to two dollars a piece, and they took this uh, photo of it. And of course, it was this big story. But this demonstrates the level of of seriousness and and just how insanely bad the economy was at this time. Well, it was during this time that this greatest generation learned something very, very valuable. They became masters of their money and masters of frugality. And so when they survived this Great Depression and they made it past World War II and they came back to California... They were masters of their money and masters of frugality. They saved, they avoided debt like the plague, and rather than buying new things, they simply fixed them. And as a result, Christians among that generation were the most consistent tithers that the American church has ever seen. It was upon their tithes and upon their backs that California churches, church buildings, were built. Now, friends, I believe that financial hard times are upon us. I'm afraid that we're all going to have to take our lumps. This week is only the beginning. I understand that a $2.2 trillion bailout is coming down right now. It's been signed. But do you really think that's going to help us in the long run, considering that's just going to be added to our national debt? I truly believe that we must make drastic changes in our financial practices if we are going to survive this time. And our best option is to look to God and to the Scripture. To ask ourselves the question, what does the Bible say about our finances? How do we apply it? And how do we thrive in our financial lives? Now, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus spoke more about money than he did about prayer. Jesus spoke more about money than he did about heaven and hell combined. Did you know that half of Jesus' parables 
are about money. Why is this? Because more than what we say, the way we handle our finances are a perfect demonstration of what we value and what we believe. You see, anyone can give lip service to anything. Anyone can raise their hand and say, I love God, but our wallets betray us with the truth. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do three things. One is I want to offer a few warnings, warnings before we unpack this. The second thing is I want to examine some dysfunctional American financial practices. And number three, I want to examine the biblical counterpart for those practices. And so let's get into these warnings. The first warning is that we have to go back and decide who is the Lord of our lives. I will say that our own finances are often the last bastion of personal self-sufficiency. Our own finances are often the last holdout in our obedience to the Lord. We're willing to give up this area and we're willing to make this change. We're willing to do this. But when it comes to finances, oftentimes we bury it deep within ourselves and we say, this is one thing that I am keeping. It gives us an apparent incredible amount of control over our lives. Financial advice that involves giving and saving and avoiding debt is about as popular as a lecture on losing weight or how to raise your own children. This isn't a topic that anyone necessarily wants to hear, but the scripture has many things to say about it. And we have to go back to our roots and decide, is Jesus Lord of our lives or not? If he is, then we have to submit even our finances to him. We can't serve, as Jesus said, both God and money. Mark eight thirty four, which says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Besides, no matter what we think or what we do, the Lord made this declaration to his people in Haggai chapter 2. Now, this is a time when all of the refugees were returning to Jerusalem and they were rebuilding and all of the people were rebuilding their homes, but they weren't building buildings for ministry. And the Lord called them out. And in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, this is what he says. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. And so regardless of what we think, he owns all of the resources anyway. And so the first warning is to decide what you're going to do with your life. Is, are your finances yours or do they belong to your Lord? Here's the second thing. I don't want you to be bludgeoned or made to feel stupid or guilty or foolish if you're just now starting on this journey. I remember I had a friend, this was back in the day when there wasn't a lot of cloud storage. She had a laptop. And on that laptop, she had thousands of photos from school and from college and from all these experiences that she had in her life. And she didn't back any of it up and her laptop was stolen. And I remember she was devastated. But how helpful would it be for you to have gone up to that gal and said, your laptop was stolen. Why didn't you back up your photos? Jeez. Well, of course she knows now, but that's not very helpful. So I want you to understand that if you're new to this journey, this idea of handing over your finances to the Lord, I don't want you to feel stupid or bludgeoned or guilty. I'm not trying to do that. I'm saying we can start today and do things right now the Lord's way beginning today. Here's uh, the second warning is that I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Getting control of your finances can be overwhelming. It's complicated, and sometimes it can feel so complicated that it makes us want to shut down. It's like, I'm never going to figure it out. I'm never going to be able to do it. It's too hard. Just forget it. And this is exactly why Dave Ramsey refers to these as baby steps. You take little steps, little steps, one at a time, and over a period of time, you'll find that you'll have gone the distance. And here is the last warning. The last warning is that there is no quick fix for this. If you see a meme on Facebook and, and it says, if you repost this in two weeks, you're going to get a financial blessing. It's not going to work. If you just have faith and strain with your innards that God is just going to lavish the money upon you because you prayed for it, it's not going to happen. 
If you hear a TV preacher that says, if you will sow into the ministry, the Lord's going to sow back to you. It's not going to happen. That sort of magical formula to gain money is not in Scripture, and it's not even observable in reality. There are no quick fixes to this issue. There is a formula. There is a magic or a, a regular principle-based formula that's found in the Scripture, and if we follow it, we will thrive financially, but it is not a quick fix. So let's do this. I want to unpack some of the dysfunctional practices that we have here in the U.S., but I want to, I want to tell you a story of a video that I saw back in 2004, and this video changed the way I view culture. It was 2004. It was a post-9-11 world. Everyone was worried about a terrorist attack. And a video surfaced that showed a bunch of kids somewhere between three and seven years old. The kids uh, appeared to be wearing um, Middle Eastern garb and they were speaking in Arabic. They were acting like normal kids, horsing around, playing games. Except for the game they were playing was cut the head off the infidel. And so one little kid would run up and he would lay down and another kid would come up with some sort of saw, like a fake saw, a toy, and would saw that kid's head off and they would laugh. And then then they would rotate and another kid would be the infidel and somebody else would get to be the terrorist and they would saw the kid's head off. And they were going back and forth, playing this game, laughing and having fun. Now, we step back and we look at this and we say, that's horrible. And yes, it is horrible, but it demonstrates perfectly that we are not very good judges of our own culture. The truth is that in whatever environment in which you grow up, that is normal. So if you grow up and your dad and your uncle and your cousins and your older brothers are always talking about cutting the heads off of infidels and actually you're watching them do it, this is going to be normal. I say this because we have things in our culture that when you compare them with the history of the world, they are dysfunctional, they're toxic, they're destructive, and they're not normal. But we, because we grew up here, see them as being normal, natural, and everyday occurrences. They are our own cut the head off of the infidel issues. We don't see it because it's part of our culture. So here's the first one. Uh, The first issue is what I call the upgrade culture. The upgrade culture is essentially the allure of the new. We want things that are new and shiny. Now, if you happen to live during medieval times when Rome had collapsed, the opposite was true. Everything that was old was good. Romans had the best, best technology, so you would look for old maps, old documents, old technology. Everything was backwards. In today's day and age, all we want is stuff that is new, and this is no better demonstrated than things like CPUs or the iPhone. Now, I'm not picking on iPhone users. In fact, this is being filmed with an iPhone. But it's funny how the iPhone 1 comes out, and everyone's all crazy about it, and all these apps, and then the iPhone 2 comes out. Ooh. Yeah, I have the iPhone 1, but the iPhone 2 has this. But then the iPhone 3 comes out, and every time they come out with a new model, they they upgrade the RAM, they upgrade the storage space, they upgrade the memory, they upgrade the, the pixels on the camera, and they just keep inching their way up so that you will be dissatisfied with the model that you have. And so if you have this iPhone and all your other friends are getting the newest iPhone, you feel kind of left out. Now you know that Apple's back over there and they've developed this technology and they have the ability to give you super high megapixels on your cameras right now. But the marketing part department sticks, steps in and says, no, 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 we can't do that. We're going we're gonna to do this step by step. Next year, we'll release this amount and then the next year, we'll release this amount. So they have this technology, but they release it bit by bit so that we will keep buying. And the same thing is true with our CPUs. Well, I've got an i5, it's a seventh generation. Oh yeah, well, I've got an i5 and it's an eighth generation. But the ninth generation includes this. And so in our culture, we constantly want things that are new and upgraded. If it's a year old, it's garbage. But here's what Paul says to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we have brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Now let me show you on a chart what the Scripture describes as levels of financial contentment. Here's the first one. The first one is level one, and this is from the verse that we just read, that we ought to be content with food and shelter and clothing. This is a description of someone who only makes enough money to be able to buy some sort of rental, a room or a cheap apartment. They have enough money just to buy clothes at Walmart and to eat rice and beans and to have a junker car to drive to work, and they've got a three-year-old cell phone. This is lower class. But Paul says some other things concerning finances. This is from 1 Corinthians 9. He says this. He says, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends the flock without getting some of the milk? What Paul is talking about here is he's saying that as a worker in the Lord, I have the right to make enough money to support a family. Then he goes on to say this in 1 Timothy 5, 8. He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so we have the second line, finances, where this would describe a middle class person, someone who has enough money to get married and have children and put clothing on the children's back and food in their stomach and educate them and have a car that can transport them and to be able to afford a house that can house all of the children. And so you might call this a middle class living. And then, of course, as we continue on, you might reach the next level where at this next level, now you can buy a new car and you can afford the new phone and you can take the kids to Disneyland and you definitely own a home and you're doing well. And then, of course, level four is where we have a lot of power and control. We don't have to worry about anything anymore. You can hire a lawyer. You've got all your money spread out in different things. When there's an economic collapse, it doesn't affect you. So here's the thing. Based upon 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 5, and 1 Timothy 6, we see a very clear line of biblical contentment. And it's right there. What this simply means is that if you take the Scripture as a whole, we as followers of Christ ought to be content at level two. In other words, you have enough money to get married, have children, care for your children. You probably have enough to get an apartment, rent a house, or maybe some areas of the country buy a house. You have enough money to buy an eight-year-old car, a two-year-old phone, and a four-year-old computer. You can go on vacations that include things like camping or visiting relatives. Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. He is letting Timothy know and letting us know, and I am letting you know and all of us know, That this is the biblical line of contentment and there is great gain if you can live here. And so I ask you this question. Can you live at this level and be happy? Because Paul says, if you can, there is great gain. Now, there is nothing wrong if you live above that line. He's not saying that you shouldn't live there. But what he's saying is, if you can live at this line, there's going to be great gain to this. Because here's the problem. If you are not content with line number two, every time you make more money or get a raise, what are you going to do? As your income goes up, you're going to raise your lifestyle and you will never, ever get ahead. 
Now, this idea of the upgrade culture and being biblically content, this provides the foundation for everything else that I'm going to say, because if you can't live at the line of biblical contentment, then nothing else I'm going to say matters. So this provides the foundation. Now, the next thing, the next dysfunctional thing about our culture is what I would call the ease of debt or the ease, ease of leveraging. Once again, we don't see it because we were brought up in this culture. What do you hear on the street? Everybody says the same thing. Oh, you need debt. Oh, yeah, the, you need debt to do that. You need debt to run a business. You need to get your, your credit score up. You need debt in life. The government's in debt. Everyone's in debt. It's absolutely normal. But compared to the history of the world, it is dysfunctional, toxic, and destructive, and we don't see it because it's normal for us. Now, right now, the average American holds over $6,000 in credit card debt. That's the average. So some have more, some have less. This is according to USA Today, $6,000. Now, what's the interest on that? Well, that's somewhere around 50 bucks a month. So you're losing 50 bucks a month because of what you hold on your credit card. The average total debt that does not include a mortgage from CNBC is $38,000. So it means that the average American has credit card debt, has school loans, has probably some medical debt, and then a car and when you combine all those together, you're talking $38,000. That's a lot of money and in interest every month. And of course, after this latest spending thing, our country is going to be somewhere in between 23 and $25 million in debt. Now, President Reagan, speaking of politicians, said that politicians like to spend money like drunken sailors. But then he said that would be unfair to refer to them as drunken sailors because at least drunken sailors are spending their own money. This starts young. When I turned 18, I started getting all these credit card applications in the mail. And right now, Dave Ramsey pointed this out, they even have Barbie toys uh, that include credit cards in them because we're trying to get the young kids, the young girls, and everyone to understand. Credit cards are totally normal. If you can't afford it, you put it on the card and you can pay it off. Companies now make a substantial amount of their money off of the credit card interest. So you have a, a store like, say, Target or Kohl's, and they make a certain amount of money. Well, that's not enough. We're going to start peddling the credit cards. And so when you go up to buy your clothing, they, would you like to open up an account? We'll give you 10% off of this order. Seems like a great deal, but they know they're going to make more off of you in the long run. This is absolutely not normal, it's not healthy, it's not sustainable, and it's bad math. Now, people will most often say things like, yeah, but you don't understand, I've got these bills, and, and I can't make it, and so on and so forth, and I understand that there are emergencies, and our, but our debt is a reflection of our inability to live below the biblical line of contentment, meaning you can't afford the stuff you're buying, but you buy it anyway because you want the upgrade. You want to be, everyone's at 7.1, but you want to be at 7.2. If you are biblically content, 99% of the debt disappears. Now you might say, but what about emergencies? We'll get to that at another point. If you're in debt right now, and as I'm speaking, you might be listening to this on YouTube live tomorrow. It could be five years from now. But if you are in debt right now, the Scripture gives us the clearest, most succinct, and the most telling answer to this question. The answer is found in Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, this is what the author says. He says, My son... If you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself, for you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Now, this is antiquated language. This is uh, in a world where they don't have credit cards, but it's the idea of putting up security. It's what we would call debt of various kinds. And so the author of this proverb, he's speaking to everyone as a father speaks to his son. He says, my children, my son, if you find yourself in debt, there is a way to save yourself. Here's what he says. 
Go, hasten, and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of a fowler. The analogy here is that if you are in debt, you are essentially trapped. You are being hunted by a predator. And so what he says to do in our terminology, in our vernacular, is take this debt and put it to the forefront of what is most important in your life. You don't eat, you don't sleep, you don't take vacations, you don't hang out, you don't do anything until this is taken care of. This becomes the number one emergency in your life. If you do that, this guy says, and I'll assume it's in the scripture, so it must be correct, you will save yourself. Now, why the urgency? The urgency is because the borrower is slave of the lender. This is a form of willing slavery. We sign away our lives with this sort of stuff and we become owned by someone else. Now, the scripture describes debt in an actually more painful way. This is what it says in Proverbs 13. One pretends to be rich has nothing. Debt is pretending that you have a lifestyle that you don't actually have. So you can't afford that car, you can't afford that computer, you can't afford that clothing, whatever it might be, but you're buying it anyway. And so you're creating a facade. You're pretending to have a lifestyle and an income that you don't actually have. Do you know right now there are thousands upon thousands of of people out there who make really good money and they have nothing. They make over a hundred grand a year. Right now, the California average income is 55,000. They make double what is the average income and they have nothing. If you take everything that they own, their home, their cars, their resources, the money in the bank, and you look at what they owe and you subtract it, they're actually in the negative. They are pretending to be rich, but they're actually poor. Number three is the practice, what I call, of total consumption. We live in an environment where we consume 100% of what we produce. That is, whatever we spend, whatever we make, we spend it right away. Now, according to a Forbes article in January of this year, somewhere between 50 to 75% of American workers live paycheck to paycheck. And you've heard this all the time. Oh, yeah, we got people out there living paycheck to paycheck. And I often hear people on social media complaining that they live paycheck to paycheck. And the reason they claim that they're doing this is they're not getting paid enough. And if they were to get paid what they refer to as a living wage, all of the problems would be solved. Now, I understand there are people out there who are in the fight of their lives. You might have a single mother trying to raise children. You might have someone who's caring for an ailing relative, someone who's got a medical issue. There are people who are literally living paycheck to paycheck and they are living frugal lives. I'm not talking about them. The majority of people living paycheck to paycheck aren't the ones following the steps one and two. They aren't satisfied with frugality. They aren't satisfied with a four-year-old computer, an eight-year-old car, and a two-year-old phone. They aren't satisfied with eating rice and beans at home. They aren't satisfied that they can't go to a movie, can't go to Disneyland, can't go on a vacation, can't do this. They are not satisfied, and so they are spending all of their money and then suggesting that they can't live paycheck to paycheck, and it's somebody else's fault. This is called total consumption. They spend whatever they earn. And by the way, getting a raise is not going to help because you give that same person a raise, As the money goes up, the lifestyle that they live will simply match it. So what does the scripture say about total consumption? Remember that the Bible uses agrarian terminology. In the scripture, everyone lived on farms and out in the, you know, in, in, um, you know, they lived out in the wilderness. And so we right now, since 2005, more people on earth live in cities than do out in the country. So a lot of the things that we're going to look at refer, use agrarian language, but we can still uh, translate them to us. So here's one, Proverbs 21, 25. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. 
the writer is saying there's two types of people. There's wise people and there's foolish people. Foolish people have treasure and oil in their home, stores of it. See, we don't think about, we think of money and bank accounts, but they had to store stuff. They literally had barns filled with stuff. So a wise person stores up this stuff. Why? Because they know that in one year, there's going to be a bad crop. There's going to be a war. There's going to be a famine. There's going to be a depression. And so the wise person stores up for themselves. What does the foolish man do? The foolish man eats all of their food. In our terminology, the foolish man spends all of his money. Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance. I like this idea. You have men and women out there working, and they're, they are diligent with their resources. They're planning, and they have an abundance. They're saving it up. That's one group of people. But there are another group of people that are hasty. In our terminology, you have someone that says, I'm making money, I'm going to save it, I'm going to invest it. And there's another person who is hasty and says, oh, I went to Kohl's and I want this. I went to Target and I want this. I went to my favorite shop and I saw this. There's an upgrade I can get for my car, my computer, my phone, whatever it might be. I'm going to buy that. That person is hasty. They don't think about, hey, did you budget for that? Well, I don't know. Do you have the money? I don't know. I see it. I want it. It's an upgrade. And yet, The diligent have an abundance. Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard. This is a reference to lazy people. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having a chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. This is a reference to someone that doesn't want to work. But the author is elevating the idea of an ant who works, who gathers, and prepares for the winter. I like what Proverbs 13.11 says. Whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. And this is the thing. We think I'm never going to be able to save money. Well, I can only save 25 bucks a week. Well, what if you'd started saving 25 bucks a week 20 years ago? How much would you have? It's exactly it. You don't have enough money to save a lot of money. You do it little by little by little, and then you watch it grow. Proverbs 13.22 says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And so I asked the question, do you want to be a good man? Well, of course we do. What does the scripture say? It says you're going to save up and have something to share with your grandchildren. That makes you a good man. Now look, These are some hard-hitting truths. But the culture that we live in says, no, burn through every dollar you have. Just spend it. Get what you want. Here's number four. We have a culture of entitlement. Now, folks, President Trump just signed a $2.2 trillion bailout. Trillion. And that bailout is the perfect example of an entitlement culture. The American people are not smart enough, wise enough, or financially astute enough to save their resources in case of an emergency. So the government has to bail us out. Our culture screams that somebody else is going to take care of your problem. Well, I I got injured. How do I pay for it? Well, somebody will pay for it. You go to an emergency room, they have to fix you, even if you don't have any money. We have insurance. You crash your car, it's okay. You have car insurance. You set a fire to your home, it's okay. You have fire insurance. You lose your job, there's unemployment insurance. You get hurt, there's disability insurance. Well, I'm too old, I can't work anymore. We have social security. Our culture creates this idea of no responsibility, and our tendency is not, and it's not just our tendency, but we assume and we demand that if there's an emergency, somebody else out there has to take care of us. I lost my job. How am I going to make my rent payment? There's a virus going around. I can't go back to work. How am I going to pay my bills? In any other time in the world, they would say, you pay your bills when you can't work because you saved something. In our culture, it's don't worry, somebody's going to take care of you. What happens when the government isn't able to do that? 
You know, with the fires that went on in California, we had insurance companies that went insolvent. We have local city governments that have gone insolvent. Social Security, do you think it's going to be there when you need it? It's probably going to go insolvent. Our culture is dysfunctional and crazy because it says you don't have to worry about yourself. Somebody else is going to provide when there's an emergency. But what does the scripture say? Paul says in Galatians 6 that we need to carry each other's loads, but he ultimately says that each will have to carry his own load. You've got to be responsible for yourself. Proverbs 27 says, know well the condition of your flocks. And give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever. You get the idea of someone else, of someone who, who understands their financial situation and they're putting energy into it. Okay, I've got this much money, this much money's coming in. Here's what I need for retirement. If I put this much in, it's going to equal this much when I'm 65. You get this idea of someone who is putting time, energy, and thought into providing for themselves in their, and their families. Because why? It says it, riches do not last forever. Our culture screams, you are entitled during an emergency for someone else to take care of you. Don't worry, you don't have to do it. Now here's the last and fifth one. It's hoarding versus sharing or hoarding versus giving. When stuff hits the financial fan, when depressions occur, the people that have wealth will tend to pull in. I've got my money. I'm going to hoard it. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait. You have needs. You have needs. You have needs. Too bad. I'm hoarding my money. But look what the scripture says. Even though we're supposed to be prepared, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. He who trusts in his riches will fall. So the world would say, pull back, hoard, and guard. And yet, even in troubled times, we are to be givers. There are people out there who are struggling, and we can be a blessing to them. When our financial houses are in order, when we've got our things secured because we followed the way that God has laid out our our financial futures, if we do that, we're going to have extra and we'll be able to really help people that are in need, but also we'll be able to continue giving to ministries that teach the gospel. And certainly churches and other ministries are going to take a hit during this time. I mean, I'm, not, I'm still giving to uh, the ministry, but I, I'm not giving as much because I'm, I'm not making as much. But even during these troubled times, we can still be givers to support the ministry of the local church and and other industries as well. You know, there's a story of an acquaintance of mine. I haven't seen him in 20 years. It's kind of a long lost acquaintance. He's from South Korea. He was married and moved to the United States in the 1980s. And when he got here, he had three strikes against him. He didn't speak English. He had no education, and he had no money. You know what people would say today? It's so unfair. He got a job working at Burger King, and it just doesn't pay enough to survive. It's not a livable wage. You know what? He didn't care. He was a Christian man. He knew what the Scripture says. So you know what he did? He got a job at Burger King working 35 hours a week. He couldn't pay the bills on 35 hours a week at Burger King, just like you can't today. You couldn't in the 80s either. So you know what he did? He got a job at Taco Bell too. He worked at Taco Bell 35 hours a week. He worked at Burger King 35 hours a week. He was married. He was able to buy a little apartment. And uh, he even started having children on those two jobs. You know what he did? He recognized the biblical line of contentment and he lived below it. Working at Burger King and Taco Bell, he saved money every single month. After five years quit both of those jobs because he bought himself a business. Instead of working now for Burger King and Taco Bell 70 hours a week, he had a laundromat. And now he worked at his laundromat 70 hours a week. And you know what he did? His money, his income went up. His lifestyle stayed the same. And now there was a bigger gap and he was able to save more and more and more. And then he sold that business at a profit and he bought another business. By the time I met the guy, it was late 1990s, early 2000s. 
He had a very large and nice home in the East Bay that is now probably worth 900 grand. He was able to send all of his children to college. He paid for them cash out of his pocket, his children's college. Why was he able to do that? Well, it's fairly simple. He lived below the biblical line of contentment. He stayed away from debt like the plague. He didn't practice the total consumption. He, he lived way below what he made and he saved the gap. He didn't have this entitlement mentality that somebody else has to provide me with a living wage. Somebody else has to, has to take care of me. He took personal responsibility. And during this time, he gave charitably to his local church. Whenever I hear someone complain about their finances, I just think to this story. There is no magic bullet that is going to fix your finances, but there is a scriptural path. There is a path that the Lord has trailblazed in front of us. And if you will humble yourself and say, Jesus is Lord, even over my finances, and start walking this path, you will do well. If you will live Below what you make, live at a level of contentment. If you will flee debt, if you will not consume everything you make, if you will take personal responsibility and be a charitable giver to the ministry of the gospel, you are going to do well. And my friends, I hate to tell you, the future does not look good for the financial environment of our country. We can't keep stacking this much debt on. We can't continue to live this way. And I get the sense that some of you listening to me here today, you know this is coming, you know this is true, and you know that you've needed to make some financial changes in your life. Let this be the straw that breaks the camel's back. It causes you and I to submit our financial lives to him so that we can thrive, we can protect ourselves, our families, and our ministries. If we will do it the Lord's way, we will thrive.